the early 1900s, waves of Jewish immigrants from Europe came to the Lower East Side of New York City to start a new life for themselves and their families. They had to adapt to the hard living conditions of tenements and working in sweatshops. Many of them struggled to survive by working as peddlers and became known as the pushcarts and dreamers of the Lower East Side. Although thousands of women had tried through the strike of 1909 to change sweatshop working conditions for young immigrant women, it wasn't until the disastrous Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911 demonstrated with gruesome clarity the mortal dangers of these inhumane conditions that the state legislator passed laws to ensure safe working conditions during work hours for the women of the Lower East Side. During the workday at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, there was only one break of 30 minutes to eat lunch in the entire 14-hour day. Extra bathroom breaks were often denied, forcing the women and girls working there to urinate on the factory room floor, just adding to the already unsanitary workspace. Poor ventilation only made the stench worse, as did the smoke from cigarettes, while heaping piles of fabric not only littered the factory room floors, but created a fire hazard. And for all this, the workers were paid only $2 a day, or less when pay was deducted for their errors and for the needles and thread they used. In protest of these conditions, on November 23, 1909, 20,000 young women began to strike against the New York City shirtwaist industry as a whole. Heeding the advice of activists Clara Lemlich and Rose Schneiderman, the strikers marched on the picket line and filled the New York City streets of Greenwich Village. The tradition of activism among the women had been punctuated already by the 1902 kosher meat boycott and the 1907 rent strike. Activism played a key role in sustaining the strike of 1909. The women workers shared a common thread of having endured multiple underlying hardships, including not just low wages, long hours, and inadequate workplace safety, but also some inappropriate work behavior toward women specifically in the form of unwanted sexual advances. The women fought for better wages, a standardized workday, improved working conditions, and union representation. During the strike of 1909, also known as the Uprising of the 20,000, the young strikers, 90% of whom were Jewish and 70% women, faced opposition from Lazerson, Max Blank, and Isaac Harris, who hired thugs and prostitutes to beat them on the streets. These fearless young women, Malnourished and poorly dressed in the cold of the winter, handed out flyers, raised funds, distributed strike benefits, and scheduled meetings. But all of these gains for workers' rights, and in particular those of the women in the Lower East Side garment industry, occurred in part because of the failure of the strikers in 1909 to fully secure a deal with their enemy. The Rosen brothers settled with their protesting employees after five weeks, but Lazerson and Triangle remained stubborn. The strike was called off on February 15, 1910, with only about a thousand workers still on the picket line. Although the strikers had secured only a portion of their demands, the uprising nevertheless achieved some important and concrete outcomes. Philosophically, the strike had made progress as well. The strike of 1909 represented a bunch of women coming together, fighting for higher wages, better working conditions, and their fundamental human rights, taking a stand against men in power. And such success, even if limited, bolstered the determination of women to continue to find opportunity to push for further reform. On Saturday, March 25th, 1911, a fire broke out on the top floors of the Ash Building in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, owned by Max Blank and Isaac Harris. The factory fire was dubbed the Triangle Holocaust. The factory building was also known by the workers as the prison, and in this case, the factory lived up to its name. The doors, as usual, were locked by Blank and Harris, making it impossible for the workers to escape. Why was the door locked? Who, who well, you know, they were afraid that the women would take blouses and run in. Now, did, how could they take any Did anyone blouses? ever do that? Did, did you ever hear about anyone being caught no, doing that? No, no, they wouldn't. No. Everybody was doing individual things. One was tucking, one was making sleeves, one was making this. They weren't mm -hmm. making the whole waist. They weren't sewing that whole waist. They didn't bother. The young girls wouldn't bother. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, the bosses thought that they'd get away with it. There were three ways out of the eighth floor. Two stairways, the elevators, and an exterior fire escape. The door to the Washington Place stairwell, according to accusations of employees who escaped the fire, was locked to prevent employees from taking unauthorized breaks or stealing company property. So many women climbed on the fire escape at once so it collapsed, sending all of their bodies, some with their clothes in flames, to the ground below. The trapped women jumped into the elevator shafts, and some even tried to climb the elevator cables to escape burning in the flames. Many women, panicked, leaped out of windows onto the street, falling to their deaths. The impact of the bodies on the street were so strong that some broke through the iron grates in the sidewalk. The bodies were then spread out on the street to be identified. While the fire is over, the girls are dead, and as I write, the procession in honor of the unidentified dead is moving by under my windows. Now what is going to be done about it? Harris and Blank, the Triangle Company, have offered to pay one week's wages to the families of the dead girls, as though it were summer and they are giving them a vacation. Three days after the fire, they inserted in the trade papers this notice. Notice, the Triangle Waste Company begged to notify their customers that they are in good working order. Headquarters, now at 911 University Place. The day after they were installed in their new quarters, the building department of New York City discovered that 911 University Place was not even fireproof, and that the firm had already blocked the exit to the one fire escape by two rows of sewing machines. And still, as I write, the morning procession moves past in the rain. For two hours, they have been going steadily by, and the end is not yet in sight. Never have I seen a military pageant or triumphant ovation so impressive. It is four hours later, and the last of the procession has just passed. The people of the Lower East Side started protesting, bewildered and angry, that such a tragedy like this was made possible due to the lack of concern by the factory owners. Other workers came to the fire to offer testimonies and demand that Triangle owners Harrison Blank be brought to trial in justice. In August of 1913, Max Blank was charged with locking one of the doors of his factory during working hours. Brought to court, he was fined $20 and the judge apologized to him for the inconvenience. The fire highlighted the inhumane working conditions to which industrial workers were subjected. To many, its horrors epitomized the extremes of industrialism. The women's strike of 1909 and what they fought for was sadly validated due to the horrific tragedy of the day it rained bodies. Shortly after the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, on June 30, 1911, the state of New York created a factory investigating commission to study safety, sanitation, wages, hours, and child labor in places like sweatshops, canneries, and bakeries. During the period 1911 to 1914, 36 new laws reforming the state labor code were enacted. The United States Department of Labor named the set of rules as the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Standards. The women who fought in the strike of 1909 stood up for women's labor rights in the workplace. Sadly, the people in power of New York City did not heed their cries for help, therefore resulting in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. The fire left New Yorkers grieving, but also left them with hope and resolve to ignite change for women's labor rights. Finally, the state legislator responded with positive advances to help the young immigrant women it once neglected.